Brown, I'm a gastroenterologist down in Rush. Been there about, mm, about 30 years now, so I've been there a long time. Um, I run a functional bowel clinic, so that's why I have so many patients with scleroderma, uh, because most of the problems aren't structural, they're mostly motility related, and that's kind of a, a part of functional bowel disorders. So today I'll go over a brief overview of how the GI tract gets involved, give you some new data on the concept of dysbiosis, which I've not talked about in the last three years that I've been invited. Uh, you guys uh, submitted some questions, a lot dealt with diet, and a lot de dealt with treatment of reflux disease, so I'll try to focus in on that a little bit as we go through the slides here, and then I'll try to answer some of these questions. We can like, oh, a whole bunch, like 30 of them, so well, some were duplicates, so we'll go through those. Um, so basically, it's, it, there's nothing really different in the GI tract than in the skin as far as pathogenesis. There's some combination that remains a bit of a mysterious soup of genetics and environmental exposures that get you into trouble with scleroderma. I think if you look at almost every human disease, it's something in your genes and something in the environment conspire to get you into trouble. It's your DNA in the environment. And the problem is sorting that out is very difficult. Uh, what we do know, however, is that there's initially a blood vessel injury. This is in the wall of the GI tract. That blood vessel injury leads to a low blow flow situation in that region of the gut. Then when blood flow comes back in, as the gut tries to reperfuse itself, you end up with releasing these sort of inflammatory or pro-inflammatory proteins called cytokines. And those guys can cause some damage because they invite your white blood cells into the wall of the gut where they start to damage things. One of the other interesting things is when you reduce blood flow to an area of the gut and you suddenly put the blood flow back in, you get release of these things called radical oxygen sort of metabolites. And these free oxygen radicals do a lot of local damage on their own. Kind of odd that we're built that way, but so be it. And what happens then is you get this abnormal repair. In, in, in most of us sometimes we're able to tolerate that, that injury and things grow back normally. But for some reason, in patients with scleroderma, we don't know quite why, but there are aberrations in the way they heal, and the way you guys heal, and you end up with these fibroblasts, or cells that make scar. And this damages the gut wall, damages the nerves, and causes trouble with motility in the gut. Uh, this scarring and tissue replacement is key in scleroderma. So things, the same things are happening in the skin, causing the scarring and damage are happening throughout the GI tract, from the mouth on down to the anus. So just to go over your GI tract, so you've got a few things going on up here. So up here you've got ingestion and uh, sort of mastication. We chew things up and swallow them. There can be problems in the mouth with dry mouth and reduced saliva production, which doesn't lubricate the food well, and it can sometimes get stuck in the esophagus. Your esophagus, which is an area of major trouble in scleroderma, is actually nothing really but a transit tube. Brings up from your mouth to your stomach. No absorption, not much digestion going on in there. Matter of fact, the transit time for a food bolus in your esophagus is usually in a matter of two or three seconds. It's through there pretty quickly. Uh, but we'll spend some time talking about the esophagus because it's a major area of problems. Small bowel. Small bowel, 22 feet. If you took your small bowel and you took each cell and you laid it out flat, you'd have the surface area of a couple of tennis courts in absorption. So you can imagine how it's a very absorptive surface, pulls in things very nicely. Your nutrients go in that way. Your water goes in that way. So what happens in the, in the lumen of the small bowel is something called digestion, where the enzymes from your pancreas break things down in, into smaller and smaller compounds that are easy to absorb through the wall of the small bowel, where they get into the blood vessels and they get into lymphatics and get distributed to the body. The colon's kind of a big sponge. It's a water reclamation device. It doesn't really absorb much. It just takes the liter of uh, stool you provided a day, brings that down to about 100 milliliters of actual bowel movement that you have on average every day. So it's basically about three feet long and its sole function is to take liquid stool, turn it into solid stool, and then evacuate it at a time that is socially acceptable to do so. <laughs> Something else goes on in your colon that you all are familiar with because all of you produce two liters of it a day, bowel gas. Most of that accumulates in the colon because you ferment. <coughs> So we'll talk a little bit about bacteria in the colon in a minute, but they're very happy to take the food you don't digest, which is a lot of the fiber we eat, and they ferment it. And they ferment it into things like hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, methane. It's got to come out. It's going to come out from the bottom. It's, it's guaranteed. 
From the president on down, we all produce two liters of gas a day. I have patients come in who want me to stop making gas. I cannot do that. <laughs> it's like asking me to stop making me breathe. I can't do that. You wouldn't want me to. So you don't want me to make you stop making gas because that's part of being alive and it's part of a natural function. How much you make, that might be different, and we'll talk about ways to adjust that a bit. So the drug track is almost always involved. I, I haven't, well, obviously, I'm a gastroenterologist, so I haven't met any scleroderma patients who don't have the GI tract involved. Uh, but that's because 90% of them are. As a matter of fact, I've seen recommendations that if you're diagnosed, newly diagnosed with scleroderma, besides your rheumatologist who makes that diagnosis, you need to see me. Even if you have no GI symptoms, you need to see me. Because what I want to try and do is prevent progression to some of these things like scarring in the esophagus, severe constipation, fecal incontinence. I can help you with that even before the symptoms uh, take hold. And as I mentioned, it can be uh, very slow or rapidly progressive. We don't really have clear ideas as to why in some people it moves pretty quickly, in other people it's over decades. Young or old really doesn't matter. And like in other areas, there's different grades. When you have just blood vessel injury, you're not going to see much damage endoscopically or on x-ray. You may not even have much in the way of symptoms at that point. But as you go through the various grades, you get into nerve injury. Now the motility problem is going to kick in. When you get into muscular injury, now the motility problems and distension and stasis will kick in. And then finally, grade four, with scarring, you can get actually obstruction or physical obstruction of the esophagus, small bowel, uh, rare with the colon. So let me talk a little bit about, this is new, I added these slides. Um, if you go to any GI meeting, actually I think you go to any medical meeting these days, all people talk about is the gut microbiota. All my patients want to talk about is their gut microbiota. We used to talk a lot about diet, we still talk a lot about diet. But boy do we talk about probiotics. Everybody's got an idea about how probiotics might or might not help their disorder, and it kind of makes sense. Um, a lot of discussions about the alterations in the gut microbiota by the kind of crazy diets we eat as well as sort of the environment in general have led people to believe that these have a role in autoimmune disorders like scleroderma, in cancer, colon cancer in particular, in obesity. There's an, there's an obesity sort of marker in the microbiota. Uh, so concerning that in our section when we do fecal microbiota transplant we will not take feces from obese patients. We have this cadre of medical students who are very thin and athletic, and we take their poop to put into our patients because we don't want to give patients bacteria that might predispose them to diabetes and obesity. It's just that level of concern. So basically, you have many more bacteria in you than you have cells. So although you have million, billions of cells that make up your body, you've got trillions of bacteria. The bacteria in you weighs almost a pound of bacteria. Just bacteria, I'm not talking about stool. I'm just talking about live bacterial organisms make up about a pound of your weight. If you stuck them all together, they go around the world two and a half times. It's an enormous population of very diverse bugs. It's hard to believe that we have that many trillion organisms all doing things down there in your colon and to a degree in your small bowel that they might not have some sort of effect on your, on your well-being overall. They're very helpful. A lot of people think they should be sterile inside. Well, no. The small, bowel, the, the small bowel and the clonic bacteria are vital to maintaining the health of your colon. They provide you with a vitamin called vitamin K that's important in your clotting system. They're very important in our daily sort of comings and goings, so we don't want to get rid of them. It's the reason that I sort of couch my patients or, co or coach my patients a little bit against antibiotics. Antibiotics have uses. I don't disagree with that. Uh, but there's a price to pay. Uh, one of the things you'll hear me talking about when we talk about treatment is every physician is always thinking about the risk of a drug and the benefit of a drug. If the risk of a drug exceeds the benefit of a drug, you probably shouldn't be using it. I really can't think of too many situations where I want to give you a drug that has more serious complications and side effects than any benefit it might give you. On the other ledger, when the benefit of the drug greatly exceeds the risk of the drug, and it varies from one patient to another, then we typically are okay to use it. We're going to talk a lot about that when I talk about proton pump inhibitor class drugs, but it's very important we talk about antibiotics. There's a risk benefit. If you have a cold, taking an antibiotic has a high risk for a very minimal benefit. Uh, when you have a serious pneumonia, the benefit of the antibiotics way up there, the risk is there, but it's much lower than that. So you have to be a little bit careful. I use antibiotics in my scleroderma patients who have bacterial overgrowth in their small bowel. They are useful there. We use them in a cycling sort of fashion, a different one every month over a cycle. 
there, the benefit exceeds the risk. But again, you have to sort of take into account your symptoms and what benefit you're going to get because when you take antibiotics, you mess with these guys. You change them. You become different. You open yourself up to really serious infections in the colon like Clostridium difficile, which some of you have probably experienced or heard about, which is a wickedly difficult bug to get out of the colon and not a very friendly one. It's what we call a pathobiont. So pathobionts are bugs that are bad for us. Probiotics, we think, are friendly bugs that are good for us. So you don't want pathobionts growing in there. And sometimes, when you take an antibiotic, you kill off the good guys, and the bad guys take hold, and you get into difficulties. So again, in general, this is a good environment to have. You want lots of bugs growing in your colon. You want them to be healthy. So trillions of organisms, huge impact on our health, such that when you alter those, and that can be altered through antibiotics. It may be altered through chemicals in our diet. It may be altered by the artificial sugars we eat. You know, when you eat an artificial sugar in a Diet Coke, which I still like to drink, unfortunately, um, those sugars don't get absorbed. They go down and they change the bacteria. The ones that like that sugar are going to outgrow the ones that don't. And you're going to have an alteration down there that may or may not be favorable. So inflammatory disorders, autoimmune disorders like scleroderma, and allergy disorders have been suggested as events that may occur res resulting from alterations in this microbiota. So dysbiosis is when you have a different microbiota in your colon than the average American out there eating, let's say, the average American diet. Um, it has wide widespread effects in, in scleroderma patients, and then we think it may play a role in the lung disease, the skin disease, and of course, certainly areas in the GI tract. So patients with SSC do demonstrate dysbiosis. When you take a cohort or a group of SSC patients and you do this fingerprinting on their colon microbiota, they're different. The scleroderma patients are different than an average American, even again, an average American diet. These are the particular bugs that seem to be different. You guys with scleroderma have more bifidobacterium, more probatella, more lactobacillus, more fusobacteria, and this other group called gamma proteobacteria. Are those bad? Not necessarily. They're just different. So I don't want to imply that having more of these guys is bad. And I really can't yet imply that the disease didn't cause those changes versus those bugs causing the disease. We, that, that kind of cause and effect we don't have yet. But it's intriguing that a scleroderma patient has a different microbiota than somebody who does not have scleroderma. So those are the ones that you folks with scleroderma have in excess. You have less clostridium. Clostridium tends to be a bad bug in general. There are good ones, there are a lot of bad ones, so that seems kind of actually not a bad thing. And you have less of a, a, of a group called fecal bacteria. So anyway, we know there's a difference. We don't know what comes first, the chicken or the egg, but it's intriguing that there's a difference there, and that's being looked into. So that said, some investigators have noted that that unique ecologic change might perpetuate the abnormalities. So again, it may not be the cause, but perhaps this change in the bacteria may perpetuate or accentuate the scarring that's seen in scleroderma, the altered neural intervention, or the, or the myopathy or muscle injury that occurs. Uh, there is an enhancing inflammatory response with this particular class or this particular sort of dysbiotic group. Some actually bugs, though, calm the immune system and bring it down. They're, they're considered immunotolerant, so those bugs the immune system likes and sort of calms down those white cells that are overly activated. However, some are invasive and not friendly like probiotics, and that's the pathobionts that I mentioned. So, shouldn't probiotics help? So if you eat a lot of bugs that are friendly, might we be able to make the pathobionts go away or, or reduce their ability to occupy a niche in your colon? So might probiotics be good? Well, let's look back at that. Let's look at those <coughs> names again that I brought up that where you have increased and decreased levels. Before I go through for this further, how many of you take a probiotic on a daily basis? Yeah, fair number, okay. So let's look at this real quick. So here's the increased levels of scleroderma. There's the decreased levels of those guys. Um, Bifidobacteria and lactobacillus are almost in almost every probiotic I know of. So is there, a, is there a hazard to adding to what we already know as an increased level of these bugs in the scleroderma patient? This is where it gets tricky. This is where when we don't have data, we're kind of sort of, it sounds like a good thing to do, but we're not quite sure. So if, again, if you go home tonight and you look at the back of your bottle, you will find that you are probably taking probiotics that you already are known to have an abundance of if you have scleroderma. Now, is that adding to the problem or subtracting from it? I don't know. That's the problem. Um, just a little bit of a warning in that, you know, all, not, not everything that seems natural and good turns out quite that way, so you have to be a little bit careful about things. 
I don't have a lot of data showing, in fact, I have no data showing that probiotics are helpful in scleroderma, but by the same token, I don't have any data that says that they're harmful. So you have to sort of make a decision a little bit, but I do want to at least show you what we, what we do know is that you guys already have extra bifidobacterium, have extra lactobacillus. Are they in there to try and help you already, and you're adding to a group of bacteria that are trying to help out? Or are they problems? I don't know. And that's one of the issues that unfortunately I can't solve uh, for you at this point. But it is intriguing that just like with every other disease we seem to be talking about in the United States these days, we're talking a lot about what probiotics might or might not do for us. So there's no simple answer. Both antibiotics and probiotics could perhaps worsen things. We just don't know. Um, certainly there's not enough research done. You know, patient has asked me, I think one of the questions, which probiotics best? I, I don't know. The problem is that the people that manufacture probiotics typically aren't mainstream pharmaceutical companies who have a ton of money in the bank to do comparative research studies. So they're not going to compare themselves to each other. When you take two drugs and you compare them to each other, three things can happen, right? You might be better than your competitor, you might be just as good, or God help you, you might be worse. And they don't want to spend $10 million doing a study where two-thirds of the time they're going to find out they're worse than their competitor or just the same. There's no money in it. So what they'd rather do is not compare. They like to compare themselves to placebo. That's a, that's a straw man. That's an easy one to take down. You'll find very little to no comparative data between different probiotics. I will tell you in journals we've reviewed in our, in our journal club down at Rush, I will say this. If you want to take a probiotic, there is data, at least in the functional bowel world, where we do deal with motility issues, that a multi-organismic probiotic is better than a single organ probiotic. So if you look at the back of the bottle, it's got a couple of two, three, four bugs in there. That's going to be better if it has only a single organism. Number two, probiotics that have to be refrigerated seem to be more efficacious than probiotics that are dried out and sitting on the shelf. So if you're not to hawk Whole Foods, but if you go to Whole Foods, you know they have that, Whole Foods is mostly whole supplements these days. I can't find food there, but I can find lots of supplements. But there's a whole section where they have lots of vitamins and, and alternative meds. Well, there is a little refrigerated counter in there, at least the one near us in Oak Park, and uh, they sell dozens of different probiotics. So if you do want to take one, and I, I really, like I said, I can't tell you that it's hazardous, but I can't tell you that it's helpful, at least in scleroderma. Pick one that is multi-organismic, pick one that is refrigerated. And although it's a little hassle to take on vacation with you, you're probably going to get a little better efficacy, at least based on the sort of uh, embryonic data we have on that right now. I sort of was mentioning fecal microbiota transplant. We're doing that in chronic C. difficile infections. That is being looked at in a whole bunch of different disorders, including disorders like scleroderma and rheumatoid arthritis. So they are starting to look at whether completely replacing your gut microbiota with one from somebody who does not have the disorder we're trying to treat might make things better. That data is still pretty far away because just even getting fecal microbiota transplant up and running is a difficult thing to do at an institution. But nonetheless, I would say within the next five to seven years, fecal microbiota transplant will be used for a lot of different things. Whether it's delivered, delivered orally or delivered through a colonoscope, we'll be using that in diseases well beyond just clustered immunofacial infections. So look for that one down the road. What's really intriguing about that, the reason I didn't think this would work, I was like, well, so you put the fecal microbiota transplant in there, and isn't it going to go back to just what it was before after that collection of bacteria die out? So, you know, it's good for an infection like C. diff, where you just have to sort of treat it for a while, and then the C. diff goes away, and who cares if you go back to your fecal microbiota? What's intriguing about when you, when you get the colon with a ton, I mean, trillions of bacterial organisms, you do seem to get a permanent change in there, which is intriguing. So that's, that's intrigued us to the point that now we can look at this as something we can use to treat a chronic disorder, like scleroderma. So how did that microbiota get in there in the first place? This is really intriguing. There's some studies showing that even a single, anti we talked about environment and DNA, remember? A single antibiotic exposure in infancy may permanently alter your gut microbiota. That is fascinating. That shows you how toxic antibiotics are to your friendly bacteria, how you should really be careful about antibiotics. I, you know, the, I, I'm really a nihilist when it comes to antibiotics. I sort of view antibiotics as your retirement account, you know? If you keep making withdrawals when you're young and you don't have anything you really need it for, when you really need it down the road, it's depleted. You've got nothing but resistant organisms in your gut and nothing's gonna help you. So every time you take an antibiotic, make sure you discuss it with your physician. <coughs> Make sure that there's a good reason to take it. You take it for as short a time as possible, and you don't take it repeatedly. 
Um, one of the things physicians sort of complain about is that patients come in expecting to get antibiotics for the sniffles or a sore throat, et cetera. Most of those things are viral. Most acute diarrheal infections don't require antibiotics, won't get better antibiotics, and in some cases are worsened by antibiotics. But I will guarantee you, you go to most ERs, you go to most uh, urgent care centers, if you got some diarrhea, they'll probably give you an antibiotic. Don't take it. Unless, you know, you're immunocompromised and bleeding like crazy, there's no benefit there. Particularly in a scleroderma patient where you want to maintain the ability to respond to these antibiotics if down the road you need them for bacterial overgrowth. So, again, even a single exposure early in your life can change your gut microbiota. Uh, from one that was perhaps friendly to less friendly and might predispose you to the disease. So you got to be a little bit careful there. Conflicting data on risk, Helicobacter, you've probably heard about the germ that causes ulcers. That one's pretty well solidified now. Ulcer disease is an infection. Cure the Helicobacter, the ulcers don't come back. There's conflicting data. One study shows it does increase the risk of scleroderma. Another study shows it doesn't. Really early on, back in the late 80s, they were, attacked, they were, they were tracking helicobacter infection to scleroderma. I've seen that for decades now. Um, the data's still conflicting. Um, if you're found to have helicobacter, I wouldn't, I wouldn't chase helicobacter in you just because you have scleroderma, but if for some reason, because they're checking your endoscopy and they notice it, or you get a blood test for it, done or a stool test, uh, go ahead and treat it. There's no reason to have helicobacter in your stomach. Get rid of it if you find it. It's a pro-carcinogen, increases the risk of stomach cancer. So I would get rid of it. On the specific organs, I'll go through this quickly. Your esophagus, I mentioned, is a, a big problem area with lots of difficulty in motility. So a lot of folks with scleroderma get heartburn, reflux, regurgitation, trouble swallowing. Um, in the upper right here is a video from my patients. And an interesting story on that patient. We're going to get into this in a minute. Um, this is a patient who was doing really well on twice daily. I think he was taking esomeprazole. Was doing great. No problems whatsoever. His primary care doctor read some of the studies, was worried about Alzheimer's, and stopped the cold turkey, gave him no replacement therapy. Came in with a stricture, severe esophagitis that took me two months to get cleaned up, and now he's back on his esomeprazole twice a day. Risk benefit. You have to understand that concept. And in this situation, the primary care physician didn't understand that the risk of Alzheimer's is basically zero because the subsequent studies have not shown a connection. The benefit in a scleroderm patient is gigantic. Reduction in varus risk, reduction in esophageal cancer risk, reduction in stricturing, reduction in oral pharyngeal irritation, coughing, tooth enamel loss, et cetera. So again, of all the people I treat with reflux disease, the scleroderma patient has the best risk-benefit ratio of proton pump inhibitors of anybody I see. Because if you choose not to treat reflux disease, you will have complications and they will be serious. Even if you've already got a risk of interstitial lung disease, the last thing you need to throw on top of that is pulmonary fibrosis or scarring due to uncontrolled acid reflux. So I really get kind of angry when these drugs are stopped cold turkey and then patients are sent back to me with complications of their reflux disease uh, because people don't understand that risk-benefit ratio. Um, getting on a little bit because I don't want to take up too much time. These are the other issues that, get, that are problematic if you don't treat reflux well. Coughing, sore throat, dysphonia or hoarseness. Tooth enamel loss, you can lose your teeth from acid reflux as it burns the enamel off of that stuff. Uh, strictures, aspirations, pulmonary fibrosis. Reflux is not, it's not a nice disease. You, know, you think of a heartburn, you take a little gavis gun, you're okay. No, it, it's different in scleroderma patients, much more severe, much easily treatable, but you have to use the right medications and then the right approach. Uh, stomach disorders furthering the issue of reflux is gastroparesis with slow stomach emptying. That can lead to enhanced reflux because the stomach doesn't empty well. One other problem that some of you may have experienced in the stomach is something called GAVE, gastric antral vascular ectasia. It means excess blood vessels in the wall of the stomach. As you try to heal from scleroderma, you send out <coughs> protein triggers that cause blood, blood uh, vessels to grow, and they grow in the wall of the stomach, creating what we used to call watermelon stomach. And what you do with that is you cauterize that off pretty easy to treat endoscopically. In the small bowel, it's going to be problems with slow motility and therefore malabsorption of food. Uh, poor nutrition can be a big issue in scleroderma patients, particularly late in the disease course. I'll talk extensively about bacterial overgrowth because other than esophageal issues, that's the other big problem in my scleroderma population. Pseudo obstruction, which is where there's, looks like a bowel obstruction on x-ray, but it's just the gut not moving well. And then pneumatosis, cystoides, intestinalis. 
that's, that's a disease that if you don't know what it is and you get an x-ray, an ER doc, they'll freak out because they'll see all this air in your abdomen and they'll get worried that there's a hole in your bowel somewhere. It's an accumulation of air in the wall of the bowel due to the stasis and the overgrowth of bacteria. Um, sometimes it does require surgery to cut out the area that has all these air blebs in it. Other times, giving a high level of oxygen will get that air out of there. Uh, so it's fairly easy to treat, mostly benign. The scary on x-ray, benign clinically. So what I have to do is calm the ER doc and the primary care doc down about it a bit, not to have them overreact. So SIBO, spent a couple minutes on that. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The small bowel is pretty sterile. It's the colon that's got your trillion of bacteria. And so things, and the reason the small bowel is relatively sterile because of good motility. When the motility slows because of scleroderma, things lock up in there. And what happens is bacteria move up from your, up north from the colon <coughs> into the small bowel, all the way up probably even to the proximal or upper small bowel called the jejunum. Um, what they do up there is they interfere with your absorption of your nutrients. They fight with you for your B12. They like B12, you like B12. They'll steal it from you and you can end up with B12 deficiency. Uh, they can actually sometimes damage the small bowel wall leading to further leakage, diarrhea, or sometimes malabsorption. So the main symptoms are diarrhea, weight loss, lots of bloating because they're producing all sorts of gas up in there, and abdominal pain. So here's the schematic. So over on the right side, it's really dark green. That's where a lot of bacteria are hanging out. And the normal gut is up top there. So you see basically all the bacteria are kind of clustered in the colon, and those upper sort of little, let me just find that. Oh, anyway, let me come over here. So up here on the top area are usually easily digested carbohydrates. Notice in that upper thing, they're not meeting up with many bacteria at all. And here down here are the legumes and the poorly digestible carbohydrates that are meeting up with a few bacteria in the ileum, but mostly down there in the colon, creating lots of gas. When you have bacterial overgrowth because of stasis and slow small bowel motility, Notice our green area moves way up here into the jejunum, way up into the proximal small bowel. So now, not only are the poorly digestible starches, like beans, for instance, meeting bacteria very early and creating gas that white stuff around those guys, the stuff you would normally absorb all by yourself, like white rice and such, will get picked up and turned into gas by the bacteria. So what happens is you, you, you're fighting for your nutrients with these guys who are growing up in here, and they're creating tons of gas. So you get a lot of bloating, distension, and abdominal pain and discomfort up there. Motility becomes an issue, and that can lead to this air in the gut. Here's a nice picture of that hematosis system. That you get in there, and it's all these blebs full of air uh, in the small bowel. It looks scary, but it's pretty benign, so we usually leave it alone. Uh, if, if one of those blebs burst on the other side of the bowel, it can lead to air in the abdominal cavity, which usually gets everybody a little freaked out about a bowel perforation, but it usually isn't. In the colon, usually it's going to be severe constipation is the main issue I deal with there. Uh, Telangiectasias are these little blood vessels like the gave in the stomach, and they just, they're easy to cauterize, but occasionally cause bleeding. Oh, go back there. Another big problem is uh, fecal incontinence. Uh, the anal sphincter can be damaged by scleroderma. It can be scarred, in which case it's too tight and won't let the patient defecate, or it can be so damaged that the air becomes loose and you develop fecal incontinence. Fecal incontinence is probably one of the most quality of life sappy sort of events to occur in scleroderma because you can't go out. You know, you don't feel safe. You can't go to a movie. You can't go on an airplane. You can't travel. You can't go to a restaurant. So we work a lot on that. And uh, Dr. Favuz at our uh, institution is our fecal incontinence surgical expert. And she has done a number of things like sacral nerve stimulators, celeste injections, things to sort of help tighten that sphincter in patients with scleroderma to relieve some of the issues that they get with fecal incontinence. On the constipation ledger, sometimes it's just so tight we have to dilate the area a little bit, but that's rare compared to fecal incontinence, which is the bigger issue. So if you're suffering with fecal incontinence, there's a study showing a lot of patients won't mention it at their physician. You should, because there are actually really good treatments available, and we can help you with that, and that should not be a big effect on your quality of life. Liver-wise, a few patients develop a process called primary sclerosing cholangitis, which is a damage and scarring of the bile ducts. Interestingly, here's some good news in scleroderma patients that does not progress very much at all. You don't get into trouble with it, and you don't need liver transplants. It's different than people who get it outside of scleroderma. So the good news on that disease, it tends to be something you see on an x-ray, but not something we have to worry too much about. 
So quickly through the treatment options, you guys had a lot of questions about treating GERD, which is great, because we should cover that. What can you do that doesn't involve drugs? Sleep at 30 degrees and sleep on your left side. A lot of nocturnal acid reflux is very damaging. So if you're getting nocturnal acid reflux or you have a lot of scarring in your esophagus, probably nighttime exposure is rough for you. So sleep at 30 degrees and sleep on your left side. Now that's not necessarily easy to do. So I, I don't have any interest in this company, although they sent me some information about their device. But there is something out there called a MedCline, M-E-D-C-L-I-N-E -E, pillow, MedCline pillow. Um, they sent me one to try out. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. It makes you sleep at 30 degrees, and the way it works with your arms slipping underneath it and this big sort of boyfriend pillow that comes around you, it keeps you on your left side. And it locks you in. I mean, I slept in that thing, and you don't move. Uh, you're not going to move out of that position. So as long as you're not a, you know, those guys that roams around a lot at night, you'll be fine with this thing. They did provide me the data. There's four published studies showing that this greatly reduces acid reflux at night, and you don't need drugs. You know, it's, it's a, it's a medication-free approach that is very effective. So if you don't eat within three hours of going to bed, and you sleep on your left side, and you sleep at 30 degrees, you will significantly reduce your acid exposure no matter how bad your lower esophageal sphincter is. So sometimes you need a little help doing that. This kind of crazy MedCline pillow will, will do the trick if you want to spend the money on it. But um, I, I, I will only recommend that because the data supports that conceptually. Um, you want to avoid certain foods, particularly before bedtime, chocolate, mint, coffee, obviously, don't smoke. The reason you sleep on your left side works, if you sleep on your left side, your stomach's down here. So the acid your stomach makes stays down here. It can't climb up into your esophagus. When you sleep on your right side, your stomach's up here. The acid drips right down in there. If you're on your back or your side, it doesn't help. If you're on your back or your belly, it doesn't help or hurt. But do not sleep on your right side. If at all, you can avoid that. Try to sleep on your left side. On to acid suppression. Without a doubt, proton pump inhibitors are the most significant improvement in the management of reflux disease in scleroderma patients in the last 30 years, and there will probably never be anything better in my lifetime or career in treating this disease. Um, it's been around since 89. You know, the data is ex excellent with these things, reducing the risk of damage, reducing the growth of Barrett's, reducing the risk of cancer, reducing the risk of oral pharyngeal ulcerations, reducing <coughs> stricturing, reducing pain, reducing regurgitation. The H2 blockers like Zantac and such are nice, but they conk out after a while because they lose their efficacy over a couple of months and they will cease to work. That does not happen with proton pump inhibitors. Prokinetic agents that improve the emptying of the esophagus don't work all that great. Uh, metoclopramide has more you know, risk benefit. <laughs> Let me tell you, that drug is nasty. There's, I don't know how many are on metoclopramide, but I hope you're getting your EKGs every month and keeping a close eye on that because it's been associated with some significant cardiac arrhythmias life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias. So if you're on high dose, or even low dose, metoclopramide, make sure your primary care doc is checking you for an EKG at least a couple times, you know, once or every two months or so. The other thing, if they haven't told you and you're on metoclopramide, it can cause a permanent neurologic condition called tardive dyskinesia, where you twitch, where your neck twitches all the time. And here's the bad thing about that, when you stop the drug, it oftentimes does not go away. So you should know about that. I don't like metoclopramide. I don't think the risk benefit ratio favors it in most people unless they have very severe stomach emptying problems or gastroparesis. Now, Peridone is actually illegal for me to prescribe in the United States. It's available in Europe, not available here. The FDA put out a warning that if you prescribe it, you go to jail. So I don't write for it anymore because I don't want it. <laughs> um, really anything else. We've never had successful prokinetic drugs. We just don't. So on to PPI issues. Every news station likes to scare the daylights out of you by leading into the commercial with, oh, that acid suppressive agent is probably killing you and giving you Alzheimer's and making you demented and wrecking your heart. Stay tuned. <laughs> and then they go on and they show a single study where some guy got a bunch of data about a common drug, proton pump inhibitor, a common disease, Alzheimer's, and showed an association. And humans are geared to create cause and effect from associations. We're hardwired in our brain that way. But science doesn't work that way. You have to show a cause and effect. Just because two things are associated, you know, every time the trees turn green, it gets warmer outside. It doesn't mean green leaves make it warm. It's the sun. But you know, that's an association that when the trees turn green, it gets warmer. It's not a cause and effect. Green leaves don't make it warmer outside. So you have to be careful about association studies. And every time you hear a, an investigator who quotes his association data, at the end of it, he will always say, association only, there may be confounding factors. 
So quickly, magnesium levels are extremely rare. We do check magnesium levels in you guys on Nexium or any other proton pump inhibitor once a year. Kidney problems, again, very rare, but we do check actually, kidney function once a year and B12 deficiency. Given your bacterial overgrowth, that should be checked once a year and replaced as necessary. That's it. Those are the things I check in my long-term PPI patients. Here's the stuff that's been disproven. Just yesterday, an excellent study came out, cause and effect, looking at osteoporosis and hip fractures, found no risk. Every study published since the original Hong Kong study that suggested increased hip fracture risk has shown no risk. I can't tell you how many patients who have a little bone density loss have their PPI stopped by the primary care physician. There is no data to support that, nothing. Not since the original one came out. Alzheimer's. One study suggests association. Five studies since then, no association. You don't hear about those. They aren't as sexy to talk about in the news. You hear about the first one, you never hear the follow-up studies. Nothing there. Cardiac injury, zero. Clostridium difficile infection in the colon, no association. Pneumonia risk, none. Stomach or colon cancer risk, none. <coughs> colon deficiency, none. None of these have been proven in subsequent studies to be a cause and effect. So, it, you know, again, in, in scleroderma, you guys are so easy to talk to about this. It's one thing you got a little heartburn. Well, maybe you could do with something less aggressive than a proton pump inhibitor. You guys with scleroderma cannot. You can't. It's just too risky. So they're, they're, these drugs are very low risk. We keep publishing data in the GI literature saying these are low risk. But unfortunately, the lay press gets a hold of the association studies and runs with them. Uh, novel treatments, injections, there's some new drugs coming down the road that might be interesting. They're not quite ready for prime time. Acupuncture, some people have had luck with acupuncture in treating heartburn. Surgery, I don't do often. If I do do surgery, we usually do what's called a toupee procedure where we sort of wrap the esophagus, so the stomach around the esophagus. We try to sort of reduce the, uh, the amount of wrapping going on because it can be really hard to swallow. So surgery for reflux, very last resort. Stomach treatments, my, my least favorite drug, metoclopramide. Sometimes I use it when there's stomach venting problems, but we don't have a lot of good drugs for that. Botox injections into the bottom of the stomach haven't been proven to be very effective in subsequent studies. Gastric pacing is difficult to do and cumbersome. So we're not great on treating gastroparesis. Intestinal treatments, I'll make a quick comment about diets. How many follow a gluten-free diet? What? A gluten-free diet. Okay, I'm gonna scare you a little bit. Um, when you take, follow a gluten-free diet, they replace the, protein in, the gluten protein with rice protein. Well, that doesn't sound so bad, except that rice protein is very high in arsenic and lead. And people on gluten-free diets have been demonstrated recently to have significantly higher arsenic levels in their blood and significantly higher lead levels. You don't need arsenic and you don't need lead in your diet because really what you don't need is a gluten-free diet. The only people who benefit clinically benefit from a gluten-free diet are those individuals who have celiac disease, which there is no risk in scleroderma patients for celiac disease. You have to be a really unlucky person to get those two rare diseases at the same time. I suppose there's somebody out there, but it's not you guys. Um, so that diet doesn't help, it doesn't make sense, may be harmful. Uh, gluten is not a natural human toxin. I remember the guy who's, a, who's at Mayo, who's the, um, the gluten expert there. I can't remember his last name, he's a funny guy. But he showed a picture of a Roman soldier with a short sword and a seal. He said, look, these people conquered the world with a short sword, a shield, and gluten in their pocket. They ate gluten all the time. It's not a human toxin. The diet you might consider is called a FODMAP diet. I don't know if you've heard about that. I can stick around and talk about that a little bit because I'm probably running over my time. Um, but that is a diet that will reduce some of the bloating and gas associated with it, and if done with a dietitian, it's very effective. I'll mention one other comment. Somebody mentioned a uh, book about, I think what it was called, I hadn't heard it before, so I was intrigued. Oh, The Plant Paradox. Kind of an intriguing book because it was written by a physician who kind of agrees with me on some of this idea that, that gluten isn't necessarily a toxin, and sometimes following these diets aren't necessarily helpful. His take on this is lectins. Lectins are proteins that bind carbohydrates. And there is some data, it's nascent, it's kind of early, but it is intriguing that lectins may play a role in accentuating autoimmune disorders. So he does suggest that following, that talking to your dietitian about a low lectin diet, which means low grains, low beans, and low nightshade, things like eggplant and tomatoes, might be beneficial in rheumatoid arthritis, and there's an inkling of benefit in scleroderma. So you might talk to your dietitian about a low lectin, L-E-C-T-I-N diet, um, at least some of the data published to date suggests that that uh, might turn out to be helpful.
Am I out of time? Yeah. Gotcha. So I'll stick around a little bit and answer some questions. And thank you very much. Thank you.